That camera has one eye out, only one little red light there. It's all right, don't... There are generally two little red lights on top of the camera. That one little red eye is out. It must have been out last night. <laughs> the subject of this telecast is patriotism. I will give you the, uh, the, the meaning of the title in a moment. This is a story about patriotism in the year 2024. A woman was elected president of the United States. The reporters approached the husband and said, how do you feel about the election? He said, I regret that I have only one wife to give to my country. <laughs> That has two eyes. The title, Quo Vadis America. I am, I am giving this title, writing it down, for the sake of only three of you and the entire audience in the United States. Only three. For the three of you who do not know Latin. Quo Vadis America. If you have ever been to Rome, you may have visited a chapel just outside of Rome. It was erected over a spot where, according to legend, Peter was in flight from persecution in Rome. And on the road, he saw a vision of the Lord approaching him. And Peter said to him, Quo vadis, Domine? Where are you going, Lord? And the Lord said, I am going to Rome to be re-crucified. In other words, Peter, that's where you should be. Well, we've chosen that title instead of Quo Vadis Domine, Quo Vadis America. America, where are you going? Where are we going in this day and age? Do you know one of the most unused words that we have in our vocabulary is the word patriotism? Hardly ever hear it anymore. Patriotism is a virtue that was allied to the, to the old virtue of the Greeks and Latin called pietas. Pietas meant love of God, love of neighbor, love of country. And when one goes out, all go out. When we no longer have love of God, we have a love of, no longer have love of country. We're going to investigate in a particular way today the problem of revolution. We started our country with a revolution. Revolution is in the air today. As a matter of fact, the revolutionists of our day are all arguing and contending that, well, we started that way, therefore we should continue it. So, let us now investigate this question. Namely, we do live in America in a revolutionary tradition, certainly. But the question is, what kind of a revolution should we have? What kind of a revolution? There are two kinds. One, the kind we started with, the other, the kind we have today. What was the kind we started with? Well, I can tell it in the story of, of an old soldier who had fought at Concord. And someone said to him, 
in his old days. Why did you go to Concord on that April day? You suffered great oppression, didn't you? No, Colonel Preston said, no, I wasn't conscious of any great oppression from a foreign power. <coughs> well, then, it's because you were against the Stamp Act. Oh, I never saw any of the stamps. I think that General Bernard kept some of them in Castle William, but I never saw them. I certainly didn't fight on account of the Stamp Act. Well, then you revolted on account of the tea tax. I never drank a cup of tea in my life. I wasn't interested in the tax. Well, then you must have been reading Harrington, Sidney, and Locke. Never read them. All I ever read was the Bible, Watts' hymns, and the catechism. Well, then, why did you go to Concord? He said, for one reason, in order that we might govern ourselves. That was the American Revolution, to govern ourselves. Now, what's the revolution of today? What's its nature? Violence. Violence just for the sake of violence. That is ours. I mean, not ours. Please God, not any of ours. You or me. But I mean the new type of revolt, which involves destruction of everything that is in the past. And these people who are actuating violence today claim they're in the line of the American Revolution. They are not. Now let me go more into detail, these two types of revolution. Each of these had a character at the head who symbolized the revolutions. The one who best expressed the principles of the American Revolution was Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson is the antecedent of all Americans today who believe in self-government. Who's the progenitor of this kind of revolution? Someone who was a contemporary of Thomas Jefferson. Strange to say, Saint Just, 1793 revolution. Saint Just, and all who were associated with him in that revolution. Now, let me tell you the difference between the two. And here we'll have a review, really, in pietas and in patriotism. And I will first of all describe what Jefferson taught us, what we believe, and what are the conditions of the preservation of our country. Then I will give you Saint-Just, who holds exactly the same thing that the violent revolutionists of today hold in our country. They may not know that they are adopting his principles, but they are. Thomas Jefferson probably knew Saint Just. They were in Paris together. But in order to do our American Constitution, Thomas Jefferson had, knew, had to repudiate all of the principles of Saint Just. Whether he knew Saint Just or not. See what wonderful work the angel does. <laughs> Knows when to clean, when not to clean. Angel clean, he's known as, not as Mr. Clean. <laughs> <coughs> 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 
Let's review the principles upon which our democracy was founded. Then let's review Sanchez. Thomas Jefferson founded our democracy upon two principles. One, the dignity of man. Secondly, I will just simplify it. All rights and liberties come to us from God. I will explain these, and then we will go to Saint Just. Without telling a word to my angel, he know he'll know very well that he shouldn't clean the board at this point. Thomas Jefferson. First, he believed that the government must be founded upon the respect for the individual. So he investigated what are the source of our rights and liberties. Where do they come from? Where does my right of free speech come from? Or the right of assembly or any other right we have? From the will of the majority? If it did, the will of the majority could take away the will of the minority. Jefferson intended that the majority would be the custodian of minority rights. The rights and liberties come from the federal government? Certainly not. If they came from the federal government, the federal government could take them away. Taking almost everything else away. We might just as well take away our rights and liberties. But he set it down in the second paragraph of the Declaration of Independence that it is a self-evident principle, self-evident, that the Creator, the Creator, has endowed man with certain unalienable rights. Unalienable. They cannot be taken away. Among which are the right to life, to liberty and the pursuit of happiness. That is our democracy. Those are the two principles. And isn't it interesting that that particular government and those governments in the world that deny the existence of God are those that deny the existence of human rights? Now, Let's go to Saint-Just. What did Saint-Just, and along with him, Royer, what was their principle? Their principle was that in order to make people pass through a certain door, there was only one way to do it, and that was the way of terror. confiscation of property and the destruction of life, rights and liberties. Sanchez also said a people can be, can be told, can be taught to save themselves only by violence. And the path to the establishment of every government must be upon a pile of corpses. That was the thing that Jefferson had to fight against when he wrote the Declaration of Independence. He knew it wasn't anything new. I'm bringing it up now to remind you that we're going through exactly that same crisis now that Jefferson faced. That our country today has to choose once more between Jefferson and Saint-Just. Which are we going to choose? We're familiar enough with the principles of Jefferson. So I'm going to enumerate for you. you will be, it'll be easy to identify 
the new type of violence that's sweeping our country, our schools, our streets, And I'm going to describe three characteristics. The first characteristic of the new violence of our day is what we will call elitism. Now this word, I don't know whether it exists or not, but it's the only way that I can describe it. It's taken from the world word elite. There used to be a virtuous elite, a core of heroes and saints that very much influenced any culture and democracy. The new elite practices what is called elitism. Namely, there is a dominant minority that makes a lot of noise and that uses violence to force its will upon others. They're revolutionists without a program. They have no flag. They only know what they're against. They do not know what they're for. And taking some words out of Toynbee, they're made up of two groups. Uh, Toynbee called, said the first group was conqueror. I would call one of the groups the man with the bullhorn. He's always the leader. You just watch in any violent group today that follows the principle of Saint-Just, watch the man with the bullhorn. He's the leader of that revolt. Secondly, there are the hangmen, the kind that are rifle desks, destroy property, burn homes, do anything to enforce their will. And then there are the wastrels, the group that just profit from violence, confiscate property to be in on the violence. That's the first group. I have six minutes and seven seconds. So be patient. You'll have to wait about six minutes for a commercial, let me tell you, too. Second, mysticism. This is another new characteristic of the revolution. Mysticism is a term that belongs to religion. It doesn't belong, actually, in the field of, uh, of politics, but it's been transposed to politics. Now, what was mysticism? Mysticism was a, well, it could best be expressed uh, in the... Uh, mysticism of, of uh, John of the Cross. Dodo inada. In other words, God or nothing. In other you give yourself to God completely or else you give nothing. This was spiritual mysticism. The political mysticism is, of course, there is no God. It's my will or nothing. This is what the elite insists upon. No alternative, no compromise. So they would make, in this mysticism, a tabla rasa. They would wipe the slate clean of anything that opposes them. And then after they destroyed life and property, they would ask for an amnesty and immunity. Thirdly, this is not my term. You could very well accuse it of being, accuse me of having invented it. I've often thought of giving a telecast on it, but the other day I went into the 10 volume history of Toynbee. And lo and behold, I found Toynbee saying that idea which has been in my mind, namely Satanism. Satanism is behind it too. This is the third characteristic of it. The world is built on order. There's a plan. So scientists are able to discover the laws of the universe. And in discovering the laws of the universe, men find harmony. 
This harmony and order had to come from somewhere. It came from God. What is the essence of Satanism? The essence of Satanism is the destruction of that order. The order of law, the order of morality, order of religion, the order of ethics, anything that you please. This is Saint-Just in our day. Believe me, fellow Americans, I tell you that Before the flood, in the book of Genesis we read, and in the days of Noah, there was violence on the earth. All of the violence that happens in our country is a fever graph. Read it. And it points to a decay in our civilization. How are we going to get out of it? The reason I'm hesitating here is just because there's so many ideas that I have to choose in the few minutes that are left. Which one to give you? I tell you one thing that we, we have to do. We have to realize maybe why the eagle is our national symbol. The eagle always builds its nest high in the mountain crevices when the young are hatched the eagle pushes its young over the nest and they fly down to what to eaglet eyes must seem like sudden death and just before the young eagle crashes the mother eagle swoops down from its nest down to the abyss and catches the young and then flies up into the sky swoops from out it again and repeats the process until the bird has learned to fly. Moses saw that and he wrote, as the eagle stirs among the young, so does God stir among the nations. Maybe God is stirring us, bringing us to the brink of danger. in order that we might begin to examine ourselves and restore Jefferson, the dignity of man, and the belief in God. Our nation is too full of those that are crying down. Down with the universities, down with schools, down with the churches, down with teachers, down with government, down with the police. Can you build anything down? You cannot. Certainly time in our nation to change our words. And let's begin now to use the word up. Up from all of this filth, up from this violence, up from this indifference of courts, up, up to the hid battlements of eternity, up, up to God. I've got a half hour more to tell you about this subject, but we haven't time, so just bye now, and God love you. Fulton J. Sheen is indeed a man for all seasons. He walked a paced beat, allowing us to glimpse his nature and ponder its worth and to enjoy its presence. Bishop Sheen authored over 90 books, he broadcast countless radio and television programs and ministered in many parts of the world to people of every belief. As he said many times, it is not a unity of religion we plead for, but a unity of religious people. We may not be able to meet in the same pew, but we can meet on our knees. The bishop wrote 94 books, recorded countless radio shows, and appeared on hundreds of network and syndicated television programs. His legacy is a treasure of joy that transcends time and helps us to believe that truly life is worth living.